a photometer and you're only looking for one measurement okay. point, then this kind of arrangement should do to prove the idea. But if you're collecting information on a regular basis and processing it, you need an integrator. Okay. So moving to chlorides, the existing methods, we've looked at that in detail, is just to drill. So that's the surface that you're seeing on the far end, the steel is here. So you just drill progressively, collect the dust, you analyze the dust. How do you analyze the dust? Have you heard of the thing called Contab, like a strips, chloride analyzing strips? Great stuff. For site work, I would say that's, that's good. So these are typically used for um, the swimming pool water test. So th these are test strips, it's very small test strips. May not be that expensive to buy as well. And you take a, a quantity of water you put the strips in it and the strips have obviously like a lot of striations, a lot of markings in it. And wherever the color change, that marking represents a PPM of chloride. To convert the dust into, into liquid, you will need to have a very steady process. And that steady process you need to calibrate using titration. Once you have established that relationship for your company or your university, that's fine. It's quite a useful test. Wet chemistry, I don't know how expensive it is. Wet chemistry is expensive for us. Anything which has a human person, is a person attached to it, is expensive for us. It is tedious. It's very care. It needs to be done in a clinical precision. Because there's a lot of variables. You know? But it is wet chemistry gives you really reliable results if you can find a reliable person. So. What that information gives you is something called total chloride con content if you're using acid. So you take the dust, you put it in a beaker, you put acid into it, you digest it, you put hot water, you make sure everything is extracted, you clean it up using a filter, you analyze it in wet chemistry. Perfect. You can also do the same process with water, not hot water, normal water. And that gives you something called water soluble chloride content. Okay. The difference will give you the idea of binding capacity. Total means that's the total amount of chlorides in that powder. Water soluble only removes what's easily easily removed. So the difference might give you the binding capacity. Okay. If you are doing that and if you are looking at estimating the binding capacity there is a research article that tells you to and this is your chloride profile it's now we're starting to agree that if you take the surface you know the stuff that you discard normally um, 0 to 1 mil or 1 to 3 mil if you're getting a steady portion like that if you take sample from here and analyze it and you get the total chloride as well as the water soluble chloride that gives you the binding capacity. Okay. The reason I'm saying here is that at this point all the reactions would have been finished. The best of the reactions would be happening at this end. Here, all the reactions would have finished because that region would have had chlorides for a long time. So all the reactions have finished. The bound chlorides are bound perfectly. The only thing to watch out is if the curve is this way. Okay, if the curve looks like that, and that I guess that's what you normally get. This region, so this is the chloride concentration and that's the depth. This region has been affected by the environment. It's either the water taking the chlorides out, rainwater, or carbonation has affected it, or hydroxide has leached out. Okay. Which means if I have to draw water soluble chlorides here, it will look like this. So at this point, you're not going to get any difference between the two. Okay. So that's the only thing to watch out for. 
in laboratory based test you should be able to get if you take one to three mil from the surface you should be able to get a binding capacity there is a cement and concrete research journal has an article by um, a lady, a professor called Veronica Barogil Bowning. Um, she explained how to do chloride binding from the tests. Okay. So you can download the article. What did you do? Okay. Okay. Happy enough. So and that's what we would normally get, you know, total chloride and free chloride and all of that. So in between is the bound chlorides. Quantifying that gives an idea of the binding capacity. But the only problem with all of this is that you do need to drill, you need to do wet chemistry, analysis, expensive. So the other option to get something similar to here, so just bear in mind, okay, I use the word free chloride concentration. There is a difference between free and water soluble. They're not exactly the same. They are comparable, but they're not exactly the same. Rylam has a procedure on how to get free. Okay. What they suggest is take the concrete dust, digest for three minutes, analyze. Don't wait for too long, just three minutes only. Extract the, extract the water and analyze. Anyway, so the difference gives you the binding capacity. The other test for free chloride is quite simple. You take the concrete and you squeeze the life out of the concrete and you get the water out of it. Is it possible? Can you squeeze concrete and get the water out of it? It is possible. You need heavy machinery. So we took one of the old strength testing machine and then we installed a thousand kilonewton uh, hydraulic jack and it can take an 80 mil diameter core up to 100 mil length in the middle in here and it can squeeze it and you can get the water out of it the concrete needs to be ideally it's mortar is better than concrete and it needs to have moisture in it to get some sensible liquid. And you can get solution out of it and then you um, titrate it. That's the known method for free chloride and concentration. It's called pore fluid expression. How much time takes for the loading? You need to be putting the loading. It takes about, uh, you, can do, you can do that overnight. Yeah, it'll, the machine will do it anyway. It'll slowly load the stuff. Most of these laboratories will have the old machines anyway for strength. You can convert that easily. It's a clinical process, so you will need to be paying attention to cleaning the, the cell. Um, so it has to be perfectly cleaned every time. Okay. So we were then looking at fiber optics to see if we can get free chlorides. Um, we looked at the, everybody researching in that, their obvious starting point <coughs> is silver, silver chloride or silver, silver nitrate, because we know silver will react, we know silver will convert. And that's not a bad starting point. So we then created a system where you have the fiber finishing here and there was a coating of um, a silver compound with some sort of fluorescence in it. I'm not yet sure what it is. There was a, there's a paper on it so you can read up. And actually, there's since that paper, there's about hundred different papers arrived on on that topic. Everybody's using a different system. So in the trials, we figured out that the absorption, which is a property of it, we can relate that to chlorides. Okay. So the different chemicals. Um, silver chromate or silver nitrate or fluorescent, fluorescent, it gives you a different relationship. 
it's not the end of it, okay? I'm sure this will evolve into much more stable, better compounds in the future. Um, so the way it works is, this is your, this is your fiber. In, in the end, what we decided is we look for something which will expand. Okay, and this is ideal for moisture measurement as well. So we took the fiber and we did something to the fiber called grating. It's a laser-based burning of the outer skin of the fiber. It's called grating. And you can program the laser to do that in a certain frequency. And then you coat that with a gel. Okay? And that's your sensor. So the sensor sits on the concrete. Moisture comes in. Gel will naturally expand. So you need to have a housing outside. So gel will expand, which means the grating will now be a different distance. Okay. Then the fiber can tell that the grating has moved to this far. And that gives us an idea of what is the value of moisture if you have calibrated it. Okay. <clears throat> so the wavelength that comes back the, the grading being different means the waves get, the light waves will get um, reflected at a different wavelength back. And that shift can tell us the change in humidity, the change in um, moisture. We looked at that to see if we can do both humidity and chlorides at the same time. Chlorides are far from it. And um, that's why I was saying it's not ready commercially because we've sort of pulled the plug. It's really hard. Moisture sensor, yes. It's easy. Because those gels are very stable. It's quite easy gel. Okay. And then we develop the humidity sensor, obviously, from the same technology. Now, that's the fiber optic sensors. Any questions on fiber optic sensors? Any other questions on fiber optic sensors? Uh, not necessarily. So you put the fiber in the structure or in the concrete and then you know, your machine knows what the wavelength is. Essentially you're looking at a change. So if the change is such, then you know the moisture should be such. It was Sudarshan who did the work. So one thing I would suggest is you will need to calibrate the sensor before it goes. All sensors need to be calibrated before it goes. But if you're looking at a production system, that's what they do anyway. They, they, they calibrate it, they put a value on the sensor. You know the conductivity, the standard conductivity probes that you buy, the glass platinum probes? Have you ever seen those platinum probes? It's used for conductivity measurements. They're glass with two metal probes on the side. And then they will have a, a K value in the cable. So they've they test it and then they say this should be the k-value to use. Okay. So that's, that's a very standardized procedure. So we expect all of this to be in the same direction. Can you use this for the heat? Yeah. You can, yeah, yeah. Heat will be easier to measure. If you have a grating, yeah. and the grating will change if you put a heat sensing gel. There are heat sensing gels available, quite easy. Moisture and heat will be easier. Pressure is use the same system, I think. Because the fiber distorts itself and then that tells us. So answering the earlier question, I think the pressure, strain and stress sensors are available commercially. There's a company called Strain, strain Stall. Strain. They have some of these things. These are what? MEMS based, okay. Yeah, for uh, moisture, other sensors might be more easier and cheaper. Okay. There's a lot of work now goes on piezo or piezoelectric um, discs or ceramic discs, they might be the better way to go as well. Okay, so the next topic is the um, electrical resistance sensors. Okay. I really like that idea, partially because, um, do you have any idea what these metals are? Do any idea where I got these metals from for the sensors? They look very complicated when you look at it. 
But these metals are the spokes of your bicycle. Yeah, it's a two millimeter or three millimeter stainless steel bicycle spokes. You know, the, the wheel is connected by the spokes. And then you need a heat shrink wrap. Sounds great. The heat shrink wrap is so cheap. You can buy it at any shops, any electrical shops. You heat it, just shrink fit it. Shrink fits it. Okay. So the sensor head essentially is the bicycle spoke. Okay. And the heat shrink wrap, which is the the black sheathing that you're seeing. I think you may get different colors if you wish. And you need to expose a certain distance. So we always expose five or ten. Okay. So the thickness might be two or three, depending on um, depending on how strong you want the sensors to be. That's it. One sensor is made. You need, unfortunately, two of them. All it's doing is it's telling it's telling each other this is the this is the ease at which I can send a, an electric current to the other person. So A is sending an electric signal to B. That's it. And the and the ease in which they can send the electric signal is sent back as a resistance. It's very simple. Okay. So you put a voltage, you measure the current the other way. You put a current, you measure the voltage and the diff and the Ohm's law can be used to get the resistance. So if the area change, if the area between them change due to moisture, due to chloride, due to carbonation, due to n number of things, it will change the resistance. Okay. So that's a very simple sensor. The only tricky part to it is it cannot tell why is it changing. It will tell you I'm changing, that's it. It's up to you to determine why is it changing. And that's why you're seeing different sensors because we put them at different distance from the surface. It's a commercially available sensor. Now, so we put them at different distance, which means if the cause So if this is the surface of concrete and we put the first layer of sensors here, the second layer here, the third layer here and the fourth layer here. If this layer is changing, okay, so let's say the resistance, I'm plotting the resistance here. I divide the first resistance by itself so I should get a value of 1 and with time if the resistance is increasing, what does that mean? This is resistance ratio. Okay, so the value, let's say the first value was 20 ohms. Okay, at the time of installation. So what I did is I divided 20 ohms by the value itself. So I got the ratio to be 1. And that's what this is. Okay, then I came back and measured after one year and I found that to be 30 ohm. So this means that would be 1.5. Okay. Does that mean my concrete is doing better or worse? If the resistance increases, your concrete is doing better. Okay. And you do, do you expect that to happen? Yes, you should because you should be getting hydration, ongoing hydration. So you should be getting the resistance to go higher. Obviously at some point it's going to flatten. And we also know that at the later point it's going to come down. <clears throat> we know that for sure. So that's your first sensor. You can look the same information at the second, the third and the fourth layer. Okay. All the inner layers might actually have a different curve because they're protected entirely from the surface. So they will behave entirely differently. That's it. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> if the surface layer is starting to go first, followed by the other layers, you know the effect is not internal. The effect is from outside. So moisture or salt is coming in. What we're looking at at the moment is to tell whether the change, you know, the shift in value, whether that can tell is it due to chlorides 
or is it due to water? Okay. Water can change the resistivity, but chloride can change the resistivity even further. It can reduce it even lower because it's an ionic compound. Where the complication starts is that when chloride comes in, somebody else goes out. So we don't yet know what way we're going to get the answers. <clears throat> but that's for the future. For now, it can act as a traffic light system. And that's what this graph tells you. So you can see the surface resistivity is dropping. So which means, what does it mean? Something is happening to the surface. Huh? So this, this concrete is highly likely exposed to something and that's not the time when you cast it. That's the time when you expose it. So something is coming to the surface and five mil is very thin surface. So it's immediately changing to it. But 15, 20, 30, 45 mil is hardly changing. But needless to say, all of them are changing. So this concrete is highly likely exposed. Okay. And you can see the front is coming. And you can also identify the time in which it'll reach 45 mil, probably where the, your steel is located. Okay. Happy enough?